BYA now because you were asked. Cheryl Cutter uh, wrote to us about this especially gruesome murder gaining attention out of Knoxville, Tennessee. The murders of Shannon Christian and Chris Newsom. Police say the couple was murdered in January. Newsom's body was found bound and burned. He was shot at least three times. Christian's body was found a few days later in a nearby home. Her body had been stuffed inside a large trash can in the home's kitchen. Four people so far charged in the attack. Um, police originally told us that they believe this was just a crime of opportunity. The men charged in this case actually have been described in court as a gang of robbers, um, actually robbing convenience stores and carjacking people. And they tell us it was just a crime of opportunity. Yeah, there was torture involved in this as well. And I don't want to go too deep in the details. I know locally you're not even reporting them because, <laughs> frankly, they are, they are gruesome. Shannon Christian was a 21-year-old student at the University of Tennessee. Chris Newsom was a 23-year-old trim carpenter. Both were still living at home and had just begun to date in November of 2006. One Saturday evening, they planned to go to a birthday party for a friend, but instead they decided to stay at Shannon's best friend's apartment to watch a movie. In the early morning hours of January 7, 2007, Chris Newsom and Shannon Christian were carjacked and abducted from the Washington Ridge Apartments. They were held captive in a house on Chipman Street near the Waste Connections building. Both were brutally raped and beaten. Chris was led to the railroad tracks near the house where he was shot three times, twice in the back and once to the head execution style. Then his body was set on fire. On Monday, a body found on the railroad tracks was identified as Chris by a homicide detective who had known him through his son. Detective Snodderly says it's Chris. And we ask, well, how do you know? And he says, I recognized him by his eyes. Everything fell apart at that moment. Shannon Christian was kept alive inside the house for several hours as her captors repeatedly raped and tortured her. A chemical substance was poured down her throat and on her body in an attempt to destroy DNA evidence. She was then bound, put inside five trash bags, and then shoved inside a trash can where she was left to suffocate. She died with her eyes open. Five people have been indicted in these crimes. Do you know how quick to Shannon and Chris that that char carjacking went down. Boom. You, you come down your stairs and you go get in the car and you are cranking your car and your boyfriend gets inside the door there gonna get him a little sugar. Boom. There's a gun in the back of your head, and some big sucker gets in your forerunner and puts a gun on you, just like that. It's done. They raped them. They tortured them. They beat them. Then they killed them. It's not a normal murder. Uh, people look at this case and they think that could be me or that could be my kids. Um, and so it touches people in that way. Waste Connections, which is located next to the house on Chipman Street, bought the property where these crimes occurred. In October of 2008, the house was demolished and a memorial raised to Shannon and Chris. I think a lot of people don't believe that things like that can happen here to them. And when they realize that, you know, there's monsters among us. They're coming in here, they want some protection. They want to know what to do to keep that from happening to them or their kids. But we're gonna go and get gun permits and carry a gun also. I just feel like, you know, you really need one now for security and especially if there's a home invasion or something, you, you really need to be able to protect yourself now. We started a class just for women called Women on Target and it's full almost every month. Most of the people that I know have a carry permit. But they didn't used to. They didn't then. But they do now. The Christian and Newsom families have yet to grieve their loss. Instead, much of their time has been spent in courtrooms. 
They've committed to being present during every step of the trial process for each of the five suspects. Still, the memories of their children bring them strength and fire their determination. Two weeks before this happened, Chris had that motorcycle, that, um, and he loved it. He, he rode it all the time, and we were always afraid for him when he rode the motorcycle. We didn't want anything to happen, and he knew that we were scared about him riding it. And he called me one afternoon and said, Mom, I've sold my bike. And I said, you have, Chris? I said, why did you do that? And he said, because I want a life. And that just haunts me now that he said that, and two weeks later, here he is dead. It just haunts me. I'd be sitting in that chair, and she would come, I bet, a thousand times, and slide right over the arm of that chair, and sit in my lap. She was so tall, long-legged, her feet still dragging the ground. But she would sit in my lap, put her arm around me, and look at me a certain way, Daddy. And I would get this feeling that would come over me like, this is gonna cost me. <laughs> if I sit down in that chair and shut my eyes, I can feel her do it. And it sure feels good. And when I open them, I got a rage in me you wouldn't believe. I hate in me that ain't normal. We still yet have to deal with it on our own, and that is something that we're, we face day to day. We can't bring her back. Just always remember to tell your children that you love them, your family that you love them, because you never know when it's going to be the last time that you get to say those words. I was grateful enough to tell her that I loved her the day she walked out that door. Did and her it? daddy got to tell her he loved her that night. He talked to her. Because that was one thing that we always did. We let our kids know how much we love them. And to be careful. And you just never know when it's the last time. <laughs>